are two great examples where major disruption across the industries. Yeah. Technology uh, is affecting us in a number of ways inside the profession of HR, outside the profession of HR. So today is not that good. So when I think about tomorrow and I think about trying to create a future that is better for employees, for businesses, and for broader society, I think about technology being a path to enabling and removing some of that manual, low value work that doesn't bring a lot of satisfaction to individuals. Um, but I also know human beings enough to know that we're not just simply going to lay off a third of our workforce and just keep doing what we're doing. We're human beings. So we're going to evolve and we're going to adapt and things such as emotional intelligence, um, the human relationship will take on greater importance as technology allows us to customize and enable um, individuals to make the decisions they want for their lives. I mean, in a really kind of odd example, think about something like Netflix. Now you can go on Netflix, watch the shows you want. And after a certain period of time, they'll tell you what you should be watching. That's yeah. going to occur in workplaces. That's going to occur across multiple different functions. So I think that the, the, while the work will shift, um, I think that individuals who are currently in roles that are administrative need to look at the future in terms of the opportunities that present themselves and focus their attention on building the skills necessary to succeed in that new environment. And if it was me, I'd be doubling down on emotional intelligence because as those manual tasks are removed, that relationship takes on greater importance. How, how have you managed to shift that? Have you done anything to help shift that mindset in your own teams to help, to help them understand that that is coming and it's not something that's just you hear about on LinkedIn. <laughs> this is a real thing. This is happening and we, we need to adapt. Have you done anything, Matt, with your team to help yeah, them? We've done that. And I think it's just that you have to paint the picture of what the future looks like and give people comfort on where we're going. It's when you don't have the clarity and you have ambiguity about the future that people get a little bit nervous. So we do, a, I think we do a pretty good job of, of talking about where we're headed um, and why it's important to go there and talk about the support that we're going to provide to individuals along the journey so that no one feels like they're going to be left behind. This is not a, we're going to remove our workforce and just bring in new people. We're going to help you transition into a new way of working and you'll have the opportunity to self-select in and we'll help you or self-select out. And that's totally okay. Danielle, what scares Great. you the most about all of this in your organization? Um, I would say what scares me the most um, to me, I feel like with change, there's um, there's the minds and then there's the hearts, right? And I think um, for, for me, I think it's very clear um, in our company and in the industry more broadly, um, the reasons why we need to change as a business, um, which, which is is kind of hitting at the at the mindset um, and the actual business case, which is logical and of course makes makes a ton of sense. Um, for me, I think what scares me the most is um, changing the hearts because I think um, everyone is so different as individuals and kind of what draws them to a workplace, what they want out of an employer relationship. Um, and so I think what that's probably what scares me the most is, is managing the emotional aspects of the change in a way that's, that's genuine and authentic to, to them. Um, and which is, I guess, kind of scary because my groups are so vastly different. Um, that's like, how do we do this in a good way that try to, to include everyone possible in this change where we really need everyone to be on board uh, as much as possible. So I'd say that's probably the scariest thing. And, you know, in my experience, and, and I've also been through some really massive transformations in organizations, there's a couple of things that I've learned. The first is, again, like I said before, the case for change is so important to get yeah. at the heart and the mind so that people understand what it is that you're doing and really and truly why. And, and Matt talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, and then a clear path of what the change is going to look like. So how how things are going to change, but also the, the old with them, right? What's in it for me yes. is still so important and applicable and to take the time to drill all the way down to a personal level and help people understand how a broad change, whether it's operational or organizational, is truly going to impact their own yes. lives, their own experiences. And third, that one size does not fit all. And you said, you made a great point about you have multiple groups and sometimes the HR strategy needs to be differentiated by group so that you can get the right message and right emotion across. But more than anything, I love, and Matt and Chris are going to have a field day with this, but 
I love that you brought up the heart because <laughs> <laughs> on the right side of his mouth. Uh, but to me, you know, I think I, I often on the show, I'm the one who sort of represents the heart piece of it and putting that humanity and the heart piece back into the workforce. Me and Matt are human though, just so you know. <laughs> we're, not, we're not heartless me and matt are not heartless we, we do have some hearts as well do you have proof share one <laughs> what <laughs> share a piece of my heart with you is that what you're asking matt not on not on live not on the live show, not on the live show. Um, <laughs> sorry sorry joel sorry joel. Carry on. no actually that brings up a great point which is matt claims that he loves me and so earlier before we went live he i love how you just threw that in there matt he claims that he loves me. <laughs> That's he a does. Big statement he, there, Jill. Allegedly. Yeah, you guys, stop offered... fighting. Stop fighting for my attention. Yeah, it's working. Um, Matt, you had said that it was important to you that on today's show you dab, and I didn't want you to lose the opportunity. You just threw that in there out of nowhere, Jill. Go on, Matt. You got, a, you got a dab on the live show. I, I'm not going to dab on command. I'm not a monkey. <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's I'm like just... when people ask me to dance. I'm like, okay, I dance, but it doesn't mean I'm going to dance for you on command. At some I don't point, know. I Danielle, will dance. Danielle, how important is it to you that on your episode, Matt dabs? It's extremely important. Yeah. Very important. I, I'll do the wave if you can. <laughs> do, like, and I don't mean one of these waves either. I do like a, I do like a, a dance. I want to see it. Let's go. Let's go. Go on, Matt. We're gonna sneak it in at some point throughout this. All right, show. Don't, that's enough, Lord. You don't 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 put him under pressure. You know, it's got to, it's got to be a nat- it's got to be an impromptu, natural dab in the middle. It's got to feel right in here, in the heart. Oh, <laughs> it's got to come from the heart, Jill. Right? Yeah, it's got to come from right. the heart. So back, back to back to your point, Jill. Um, I hear this a lot, and uh, you know, you know, in terms of what's in it for me, how do you achieve that on scale? Because that's where I think companies struggle. Like it, we all seem to know this, but trying to achieve that when you've got you know a hundred thousand employees, yeah. I'm speaking to companies. How do you do that? You know, it, it, people say, yeah, one on ones, but one on one with a hundred thousand people, is that what? Is that really what is? Is that feasible? Is that what is? Is that? Is that you know? Can we do that? So I'm just. Uh, it's a it's a really great question, actually. Um, it can be done, and the answer is it can be one on one. It just has to be done in a cascaded fashion. So I think that it, it requires a very strategic and thoughtful communication process. You need people who are really putting together the business case, the how, the why, the when, what it's going to look like. And then if it's multiple departments or multiple divisions, how the change will impact the, each of those divisions. And then having a package or a strategy there that gets broken down from there and ultimately lands locally with each team so that by the time the communication plan has rolled out and been implemented, really and truly, every single person has had a chance to interact with the content. And then on broader scales, I've worked with companies that use technology, ironically, um, to deliver messages, um, whether that's a video or some, a lot of companies now are moving toward gamification so that there's an opportunity for employees who are impacted by the change to interact with the change, learn more about it. Uh, There are town halls, people call in, they host them by webinar, or some companies put together these packets and roll them out to the managers in the organization so that those managers can have smaller local meetings or interactions with their teams. Hey, Chris, this is a great time to mention it. A number of companies have been talking to us lately about something I think is a bit unique in this space, which is the idea of having an internal company podcast. Yeah, I love, I love that's, that. That's, that's, oh yeah, good. That's a good point. I man. love that idea. I mean, I think you know, especially for a millennial audience that wants to yeah. consume content when it suits them, the idea of a company newsletter just makes me want to pull the remaining bit of hair. <laughs> I love a podcast though. In the like, intranet. Let's log into the internet to see what's happening today. <laughs> <laughs> no one's, no one's doing that. Not, not, not the no. news. Maybe, maybe, no, just no one's going on the internet. I would rather have the leaders of the organization or vendor partners or people people from the from the organization talking on a podcast and just being real. Um, I actually think that's the future. I also think um, the, the most cutting edge companies and the most sophisticated companies are going to be doing podcasts that they're going to share internally and externally, no filter, because it's great branding for both your internal organization and also for, to tell the broader marketplace what you're all about how you treat your employees what's important to you i think that's the way to go so i would say um that's another great way of doing that 100 percent agree with you and as you know i've been pitching this for a while <laughs> and i am working with some great organizations at the moment that will be releasing podcasts soon for this exact purpose so i'm excited to, to share more on another you know future episode and also it doesn't cost anything 
Nope. You know, it, oh, it doesn't, it costs time, of course, and it takes time, time is money. But, you know, we're talking about everyone, there's a company who's investing in these, you know, messaging apps and technology, spending millions, hundreds of thousands of pounds. Whereas, guess what? People already have these applications on their phone. People already have Spotify, for like iTunes, you know, Google Play, the list goes on, right? There's going to be one of those apps that people use. So why don't you just be where people already are? Yes. Why, why, why try and bring do the hard work of bring them to you and be where people are? That's exactly why right. we have the podcast, right? We're everywhere. We don't just cater to one. Let's talk about being flexible, right? <laughs> we don't cater to one audience. We're everywhere. You want us over here? We'll be there. We'll, 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 ho- we'll post the podcast there. So Matt, I think that's a great idea. And, yeah. um, and even if it doesn't mean just, and also for small businesses as well, it's perfect. Not just for big, big organizations that are well-known for small startups, small winners. If startups. I was a small startup and I had myself as the employee, I would find five or four other startups in the same industry space. And I would share a podcast and do an episode a week and just rotate it because I couldn't fund it necessarily myself, maybe because I don't have a lot of you know, excess capital when you're just starting out. But I'd be sharing that responsibility, building community and telling the story of our broader industry using the podcast as, as a conduit to do that. I just think it's such a great way of doing it. It's audio, it's video, and it gives a great authentic look inside your organization. Yeah. Well, if, if anyone needs any more proof, you just need to look at our podcast and this live show. You know, right. we're, we're a team of three and we're, meet, we're, and we're reaching half a million people a month. Wow. You know? And LinkedIn. we're offering to help people host their internal podcasts. If yeah, they we, want. <laughs> we, we, we don't, we're multifaceted over here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're in a bit off topic there, but um, we, we, we spoke about the same thing for, you know, and there's multiple reasons to use it, you know, for recruitment, for, for even uh, um, for obviously delivering the message, for introducing new leaders, people into the business. So once you hired someone into an organization, Imagine if you're hiring a new CEO into a business and he comes on the internal podcast and talks about his vision for the organization. How amazing would it be to introduce new employees, not just senior, you know, junior, all the way through the ranks, an incredible way to introduce people yeah. to your business um, as well. Internally and externally. And externally, yeah. Right. Customer, I want to know what the new CEO's vision is of the How product amazing. service that yeah, I'm buying. Right. And what a great way to kind of unite different offices and virtual workforces too. Yeah, that's right. You know, that's an amazing a, a yeah. great example is Zappos. So uh, yeah. the, the Zappos model is exact is exactly what this is about. I heard Jennifer Lim do a talk a couple weeks ago, and she talked about how she and Tony Shea worked together to put together their culture statement, which was this book called Delivering Happiness that that probably many of us know about now. And the book is just a bunch of verbatims from people in the organization that talked about what what was working, what wasn't working and how they honestly felt. And now this book is in how many languages and how many countries and and that was never they never even realized but it's incredible marketing for the company as well so amazing i and love they're, yeah. they're being authentic right and it's people read that you know it's not some pre-rehearsed let's tell you what we think you want to hear book yeah. it's just this is who we are you know the good bad the ugly <laughs> and people people love that we just said the good just... the bad the ug- oh oh no <laughs> <laughs> Oh God! I'm either bad or ugly. I don't know which one it is. But I'm not nice. uh, well, so you automatically said you're not the good. You just automatically like that. Nah, definitely can't be the good. <laughs> so. so I have a question, Danielle, for you. Sure. Generations in the workforce. I imagine that at Volvo, you have a span of multiple generations working in your industry that have 20, 30, 40 years of experience, and some people that are that are brand new college graduates. How do you see these changes impacting your population differently or do you see it impacting them differently and how are you managing to that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think for us, um, the best way that, that we feel we could kind of address all of these very different populations is to try to create Uh, guidelines and moving away from policies that are as flexible as possible. And that will allow for people to kind of take uh, pick and choose kind of what works best for them um, without it being so prescriptive or so, um, you know, kind of this, this top down thing that you have to do. Um, So something that was very recently in the news um, was regarding GM's dress code policy as a good example, where they threw it out and they said, just dress appropriately and use your best discretion and and be an adult. And um, although we think that, that that's amazing, um, I think for us, um, we want to just basically make it a little bit more uh, open than that and, and, and also say, you know what, if you want to wear a suit every day, 
then feel free to do that. If that's how you're able to do your best work, um, then we want you to feel comfortable doing that. But if you also, um, you know, like wearing jeans every day and, and a polo shirt, then that's okay too. And if you feel like that's appropriate based on the meetings that you're having, then then go for it. So the, the best way that, that we're trying to kind of attack it is to try to be as flexible as possible um, and trying to move away from, from more policies to, to more guidelines and empowering our people. So again, I, you know, I think, I think that's terrific, by the way, and, and good for you um, to look into that and be able to customize. And, and it, there we go again, it's almost the same answer and it's thematic with what we talked about with communication that we are getting to a world where more personalization is yes. what is expected, which I think is a beautiful tie back into digitalization because right. our whole world is becoming a place where we are used to and our expectations are changing to be what we want for us personally right now, wherever we are. Yeah, right. it's really about bringing the outside in. You know, yeah. We don't go home and, you know, and put a suit on. <laughs> or we don't, you know, we, well, I don't anyway. Actually, I think Matt, <laughs> or, I think Matt does, actually. <laughs> Matt's got like suit pajamas. He's got pajamas, but they're like suit. Extenders, <laughs> bow tie. He's got suit pajamas. But that's how it is. You know, it, it's little things like going into the workplace and not having Wi-Fi everywhere. Yeah. Something so silly like that will drive people crazy. The new it's generation, crazy. they're like, wait a minute, I have to be in this room to pick, pick up Wi-Fi, but there are still workplaces out there that exist that are, are, are like that, or, you know, some good points people make, you know, if I ask if internally, I want to purchase something, you know, it could be a stapler. It would take two or three weeks to get that stapler. Cause you've got to go through an internal process. I could order it on Amazon. <laughs> it'll be on my desk in an hour, Right. but exactly. the workplace hasn't caught up with the outside. And then the more we can reflect our outside experience in the workplace, then the better and more productive and more comfortable people are going to feel at work. But that's because the old model was predicated on employers not trusting their employees. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. it's changing now. So before you had to be bums in seats at 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning and you couldn't leave by 5. And if I can see you, I know you're working hard. Then if I can't, I don't know what you're doing. I want you to you know, disclose to me you know, when you're coming and going. I need you to just like, it's just that whole almost like, paternalistic view of business that extended in the last several decades is going yeah. away. And now if you don't demonstrate the, the trust to your employees, they immediately disengage, particularly millennials and Gen Zs. They just check out. If you don't trust us, we don't trust you. We're not bought in and good luck achieving your vision based on that. Yeah. What we're saying and it's like, it's obvious, but this is still happening in the majority of organizations. Right. Yes. And that's what's scary. We're sitting here talking about it like, Oh, it, it, it's actually 90% of the people out the companies out in the store operate like that. So. Right. And I think too, you know, a lot of, you know, the, the reason why I think as employers and as HR, um, we've been so challenged to kind of have this more personalized, more innovative, more kind of real life approach um, is because that kind of, that old train of thought that, um, you know, an employee will work for your company for 30 plus years and, you know, there's, there's a lack of trust and it's very, you know, um, a top down hierarchical kind of culture. Um, the reality is that that has changed and that employee employer kind of agreement um, no longer really exists and, and people um, want to be more flexible and they want to explore different career paths and, and have different expectations of employers. So I think um, that also, I think, plays plays a role as to kind of why we, we need to take this approach as HR. What's the uh, implications if, if the companies that don't do this? Predictions. <laughs> Oh, to me, it's a straight line computation. Everyone, everyone's, yeah. face went really, <laughs> everyone's face went really sad then. For a second, the everyone the was really upset. The, the clock's ticking. Like yeah. the, the, the clock is absolutely ticking. We're already it's, behind. I agree, Chris. I think the majority of organizations are struggling with this. I think those that ha are uh, most that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, the ones I talk to both internally in my organization, but also my contacts globally, it's it changes happening, but it's happening incrementally. Um, I think if I was an organization that hasn't started this journey yet, I'd be really, really worried. Um, and if, uh, you know, if you're just beginning this journey, it's time to pick up the pace. And I would put ourselves in the same exact bucket. I think we have to make that change. The change cycles, whether it's technology, whether it's culture, are happening in much faster cadence. You don't have 20 years to make this transition. It's going to happen for you. So get going. Right.
<laughs> Pray serious. Yeah, I, I would. I would agree. <laughs> Out of nowhere. Hi, Russell. <laughs> Out of nowhere. Oh, oh yeah, hi, Russell. <laughs> Did you just throw? No one's gonna get that joke though. Only us. Only we're gonna get Russell. What's his last name, Joel? Russell Boyd. Russell Boyd was my counterpart and partner at Macy's for four years and one of my best friends in the world and I love him to death and I promised I would do a shout out on the show today. So hi, Russell. Aww. Hi, Russell. Hi, That's Russ. such a random shout out, but we love you. <laughs> I miss you. Um, I, agree. I agree with Matt completely. I think it is a straight line computation. I think that the clock is unquestionably ticking and the truth is, at least in my experience, things that feel like a really big deal, when you look back in retrospect, they're not. And, you know, dress code is one of the best examples. I have been yeah. with multiple companies as they've gone through the dress code transformation. -na -na -na. And <laughs> so dramatic, so stupid. You, you can't believe, I mean, <laughs> presentations and, and pictures on the wall of, of what it would look like and, and pictures of people with bikinis that have, you know, cro you know the red X. Are you joking, Jill? <laughs> no don't do that but you can do this and oh my god and you think it's like these are grown adults up. I know. And, and hours and hours of meetings and decks and presentations and then you flip the switch and everyone is so excited and you look back and it's hard to believe that it was ever even a conversation yeah and so if i have any advice to companies that are trying to go through some of these cultural changes, try not to overthink it. And you yeah. can always change your mind. If suddenly everyone is showing up in string bikinis and that's not your culture, <laughs> you can put out a guideline around string bikinis. Yes, totally. Yeah. And you know what, like worst comes to work, like to me, I think to call something a pilot, um, if you're, if there's ever any doubt, like it, it's always like a great kind of air coverage. <laughs> Everything's a pilot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you ask Matt to do a pilot, or wear shorts with a shirt on and a suit jacket, just to make sure you both just <laughs> pilot out I'm half suit. Half. Only has my top half. Yeah, <laughs> you've got Hawaiian shorts on, haven't you, Matt? Secretly. I do not want to see him stand up. I just am putting. It up. <laughs> wow. No, thank you. So the link, are we so we, we're clear on the fact that the, there's a direct link between the culture and technology, right? I think that's yeah. undeniable <laughs> because people are still trying to, you know, this word culture, what does it really mean? Um, but when we're talking about this topic we're talking about now, you can see the direct link between culture and technology and how we can harness that. You spoke about it earlier, Joe, about the reach we can have through technology, whether it's through podcasts, through, um, through you know, different tools that we have in organizations. Is We've never been in a better position, I think, to succeed. And, that's and let's, crystal, let's crystallize it further. So here's two things. The digitization in HR is critical. It has to happen. It's non-negotiable. Start. <laughs> Second is when you're starting that journey, you need to negotiate with your organization, whether it's your senior executive, your board, whoever that looks like. You need to negotiate that once you're able to achieve efficiencies with technology, that you get to retain the resources and reinvest them into the activities that we're talking about. So right. if you have a team of five or 10 or 50 or a hundred and 30% of them are doing manual administration. Uh, success for me doesn't just look like taking away a third of that workforce and putting technology in its place. It's retaining that workforce and reallocating 30% to business partner roles, to strategic talent roles, to employment branding roles. So it's a two part conversation. It's, this is a path of digitization, which is, allows us to reinvest back in our employees and customization is possible with technology Without technology, it's incredibly manual, and for most organizations, just not realistic. Mm -hmm. I, I just I got I've just, one second. Dill, can I just? I've got a Gabe, our friend Gabe's asking me questions. So, Hi, can, Gabe. I, can I throw it in there? <laughs> um, Gabe just said, Gabe's like one of our fans. I love Gabe. We love, Gabe. We love, <laughs> love, love, love. Most of all, he said, he said, uh, great point, Matt. That was very, very quick there, Gabe, on that, on that comment. Great, great point, Matt. <laughs> and his He's question is. <laughs> and he said, how has digitization impacted how you attract new talent given the low unemployment rate? Is he asking me or is he asking all of us? Asking all of you. Well, for me, it's had a huge impact on attracting people in the HR team. So when I talk about what we do in HR and that we're paperless, people start crying when I talk to them on the phone. They're like, oh my God, there's no spreadsheets. I'm like, there's a spreadsheet, but we, we put up on the wall as kind of historical memory of how things used to be. But from an HR perspective, <laughs> It's, it's fantastic in terms of drawing people. Um, and also I, I do hear candidates who saw 
what we do on LinkedIn or see some of the content we put out and say, okay, well, you're innovating. So I can extrapolate that innovative thinking to the rest of the organization. I can see that we're going here. I think, you know, talking about where companies are and where they're going, we all, we've all said that we're not where we want to be in business. But I think if you can demonstrate to your candidate pool and to your employees that you're on the path and you're willing to make the investment and go down that journey, people accept that. They don't expect perfection today. They expect a constant progression and they're willing to be part of that and help you achieve that. It's when you get into an organization and realize there's no opportunity for change, and no opportunity for innovation, then you're like, uh, next floor, please. I'm checking out. Mm. Especially yeah. when they sell it as part of their, uh, of their, of their why and you go in and it's like, well, yeah. what happened here? <laughs> Which happens quite a lot. What's the problem? Yeah. Mm. You guys want to add anything to that? To Gabe's question? Yeah, I think, you know, for, for us, I think it, uh, from a talent acquisition perspective, um, I think it puts the onus on us to be more proactive um, and, and to focus more on employer branding um, more so uh, than probably before where it's like, hey, like, you know, putting more focus on job postings even and uh, things where, you know, you're expecting kind of uh, a ton of resumes that maybe don't necessarily pop up. So um, for us, where we've really been focusing more so is on employer branding. Um, Glassdoor has been huge for us um, and really trying to get the word out there more um, and has been especially important um, for, for some of the, the new positions that we're looking to bring in with the technology division, for sure. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your question, Gabe, as always. <laughs> we love you, Gabe. Um, I did have a question, um, unless there's another caller. Is there another caller? Another caller. <laughs> there's no one calling in yet, Jill. We're not there yet. <laughs> is there anyone sending no, messages? No, there isn't. But no, no, there isn't. You can fire away. I'll let you know, Jill. My question is the word digitalization. It's big and it's scary and it has lots of syllables. Um, <laughs> do you think that we are scaring organizations when we talk about the digitalization of yes. industry? That's a great question. I think 100% yes. <laughs> I think if you think about like our everyday lives, we're already living digital lives. You know, you I wake know. up, you, you're looking at your phone, you're answering emails, you're on Google, like we're always connected nowadays. And to make it like called digitalization makes it seem like this, like kind of like Star Trek kind of far out in the future thing. But it's like, well, actually it's, it's our everyday lives now. So I think absolutely. And I think that's a great point. Like to what extent could we maybe call it something less scary or just bring it down to earth a little bit more so it doesn't feel so foreign or kind of uh, like out of reach? Yeah, I think you're right. That's what we said there. We're already doing it in our lives outside of work. But it's just when we bring it inside, all of a sudden it's some huge thing. Yeah. I, think, I think it's all of the amazing consultants out there. They've all got together and they're like, how can we make so much money? There's this. You only have to go on LinkedIn to see digitization. digitization. I think I get an email every day for a digi digital transformation event or a summit. Or like, you know, I'm not sure if you've seen them, but like, so I think you're right. I think it's uh, the a very clever marketing out there. A lot of scare tactics. Um, when I actually speak to HR directors and CHRs and say, and I talk about this topic, a lot of them, you know, once they've done a bit of research, looked into it, they're like, okay, it isn't a bigger, a, a bigger deal as we, we think it initially should be. But there are many companies that are out there scrambling and they're all over the place <laughs> and don't really know what they're doing. So I think we're both complicated. Here. So I, I agree. It's, it's, you know, it is kind of the boogeyman in the corner, but let me add some. <laughs> I haven't heard that in years. It was easily placed, guys. It's been a good episode. I would say, so I agree, it's a bit of fear mongering in terms of using the word, but here's what I'd also would say is you need to create a burning platform for change. Um, so That's fear true. isn't the way to do that necessarily. You should inspire the change, but let's be very, very clear where we are right now is not good enough and it's not working. Yeah. We have to change and human beings, including myself, don't like it. We don't like changing. We want to find any possible reason to justify where we are today. So maybe don't use fear, but you need to use some motivator to compel people um, to, to understand that things need to evolve and that it's going to be safe and that the future is going to be better than it is today. Do you think it's because many of the leaders that are in senior positions aren't from this new generation where technology is just everyday, normal, this is how we live? 
from, from you know i've got a 10 year old nephew who's talking to me about coding and servers and you know editing and streaming and i'm like you're 10 you speak to a ceo of a fortune 500 company about any of those topics they'll be like oh my god is that a part of it is that the people at the top i'm just randomly throwing this out there aren't necessarily relating to the change whereas you speak to some new some of the new graduates that are joining businesses no wonder they're shocked to go into companies and then it's a big culture shock for them is that part of it i think it depends on the company i you know i i worry about generalizing there although i can tell you that i've certainly seen examples of that i've worked in enough environments where folks who have more experience than i do have said you know love to tell the story about when this form used to be a handwritten form and <laughs> you know i walked to school in the snow uphill and you know okay that's awesome um and you know i think that you sort of it's really a cultural conversation again i also work right now with lots of clients who have ceos that are in their 20s or 30s and so i think it really has to do with the culture of the company quite frankly the industry certain industries have more legacy administrative processes. Um, and if you compare those to technology companies today, probably you see a little bit less of that. Sure. Um, but yeah, I think that people who have grown, there's no doubt in my mind that people who've grown up with technology will be more comfortable using it as a resource and on a day-to-day basis than people who did spend time in the work world without technology and were able to get a job done. And that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. I'm just wondering if that's something people are taking into consideration. Because a lot of companies, they go through these transformations and, and don't really address that, that, that's, that group. It needs a bit more care and attention. And, some, and, then, and in a lot of cases, they're the most important point. group because they're the ones that hold the knowledge. They've been in the organization they're, and they're, they, they're influencers in the business. I think a lot more care and attention needs to be had with those key stakeholders in the organization that are from that generation. And let's be fair to them. So, you know, I'm, I'm 36. I was trained and developed by individuals who are mostly baby boomers. And now I work mostly with millennials and Gen X folks just as a function of my job. When they, when, when the boomers grew up through business, they learned a certain way of doing things. And over five, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, they, they developed those skills for success. They developed the, the proper roadmap to be able to have success in their careers, but also in their businesses. And then all of a sudden the whole game shifted and it's really hard to make that transition if you've been doing something really well for 20 years and being rewarded for that behavior. So I understand it, but at the yeah. same time, if I was a CEO in a large organization, I would be taking extra care and attention to educate myself on what is happening. And we, we had Dave Ulrich on last week. What a great example of somebody who, you know, his success has stretched over many, many decades because he has constantly stayed on top of what is trending, what is new, what is relevant in today's business. He hasn't just said, I had success in the 80s and 90s. I'm checking out. I'm going to live off that the rest of my life. He's constantly upskilling himself, which is what CEOs need to be doing today so that they can respond to this transformation and that they can have an influence on having success in it going forward. If they're thinking that's going to happen absent of their participation, I agree with you. That's a big, big mistake. Yeah, I think Dave said to me that his biggest challenge is to disrupt Dave. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> on a monthly basis, he sits down and is like, you know, how do I disrupt myself? And that's amazing. If a lot of people should have that. I, I, something I started thinking about as well more and more now is reassessing, relooking at things that we're already doing. And, 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 and the amount of times I've reassessed something and go, wow, there is a better way of doing that. Yeah. Just because this way is working okay doesn't mean I should keep doing it that way as well. Because that's where companies get caught out because they've been yeah. doing it the same way for so long. And all of a sudden, Digital transformation. We've seen we've seen it with all the companies. The disruption is happening in so many different industries now. So many of those. If you if I'd ask you, you know, ten years ago, did you think that Netflix was going to take over Blockbuster? No one would have said that. Mm-hmm. You know, no one would have said, "Oh, you're going to sit at home and you're going to stream these shows and you can watch them wherever you want." And there's no adverts. People are like, "What are you talking about?" I, I don't <laughs> miss late fees. <laughs> you don't miss late <laughs> the late fees. You just got a pile of. A lot of people. It's funny. You speak to any. I speak to anyone. You know, but anyone sort of below. 12, 13 years old, they have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned Blockbuster, like, what? You used to get a But tape. you know what? It was so fun. They had like the popcorn and the candy aisle. Just I, know. I missed that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember that. <laughs> well, in, a, in, 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 a, in Bristol, in the UK, and this is not even a joke, they have cash machines that you go up to a cash machine and you basically, you type in your code and you choose the film and it 
prints out a CD for you. <laughs> How crazy is that? It's like wow. it, it's like a, a vending machine for films. But then, what do you do with the CD? You put you, it in your disc man? No, you go on DVD. <laughs> oh, a DVD. Yes, yeah, DVD. Yeah. A CD. <laughs> oh, sorry, Jill. DVD. How did we get on this topic? <laughs> <laughs> People are just tuning out now. People are like, that's it. We had enough of the day. Hey, Danielle. Yeah. I have a tough question for you. Okay. It, it's not related to HR in any way. Okay. Oh, no. I'm really interested in the auto industry specifically because in North America, Western Europe, we see a decline in individual car ownership. Yeah. New generations are not buying vehicles the way they used to. When I was 16 years old, I couldn't wait to get a car and get out of the house. I'd have freedom. And nowadays, 16 year olds don't want that. They'd rather have an Uber membership and then spend that money on vacations and That's things me. and other experiences. So uh, what I've been hearing from other folks in the industry is that they're making strategic shifts to more fleet vehicles and partnering up with ride sharing services or with other types of fleet type businesses. What's, what's Volvo's take on that? And where do you see you guys going in the future in that area? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So definitely those are, are two focus areas for us. Um, and we look at it kind of from the broader mobility perspective and, and the change in consumer behaviors. Um, something that we just recently launched, which is pretty innovative in the first ever in the industry is Care by Volvo, uh, which is an app that allows you to lease a car month to month um, you essentially, you know, does, do it all through the app and, um, and then the car is yours. And, and currently it's, it's being rolled out with our new XC40, um, which is a very kind of like millennial, um, driven product. Um, a very cool car. It's my current car now, which I, I highly recommend. Um, so I, I think, um, absolutely it's, it's a huge focus for us as we're, we're looking at, you know, how, how consumer behavior is changing and, and what people are looking for. And um, on top of that, you know, that also brings into play electrification, uh, which is a huge focus area for us moving forward, which is win-win for the environment. And also, um, you know, consumers are saying that's something that they're really passionate about and, and wanting to see from us. Um, and also self-driving cars, which sounds like really scary and far away, um, but is, is something that's, that's coming quickly um, and, and that would bring a lot of time back in people's lives um as well and make people's lives simpler and, and hopefully safer so so yeah there's there's a ton of innovations there for sure and all of those innovations it requires a whole new set of workforce <laughs> absolutely or, oh, sorry skills sorry in correct yes and and you know it's also important too that that we recognize that we also need to have a foot in where we are at today, um, you know, and selling through our dealerships and, and they're, they're extremely important relationships to us, the, our retailer network. Um, and, and that there are, you know, a ton of people out there who currently, you know, like driving their car every day. And the, the thought of having a car driving you around kind of freaks you out. And, and I, and I get that. So I think, you know, that's kind of the fun of this whole change management journey is like, how do we, you know, stay true to who we really are and, and, and deliver on the business that we need to deliver on today, but then also um, are looking towards the future and, and doing it in, in a good way. You know, I think you make a perfect statement there that kind of ties together today's whole conversation. And we've talked about this before on the show, how businesses who are succeeding today are helping to blend the wall or maybe instead replace it with a screen door between their customers and the company and looking at the customers and understanding that they need to model and and understand and care for exactly who their customer is and if companies can start to act inside the company the way that the customers want to see and start to create more of a relationship like that if the customer is wearing a suit and tie every day and is only driving a certain kind of car, you know, that's a whole different story from who really you're targeting. And, and every company I've worked with is spending so much time talking about who is our core customer? What does he or she need, love, eat, wear, you know, what, whatever, drive. And so inside of our companies, we need to build a culture that really does show that, mimic it, understand it and live it. And so I that's think that's fantastic. great. P.S. Um, if you need a test driver of a self-driven car, I know that my husband would sign me up to be first on the list because <laughs> um, I don't necessarily, 
I, I let's just say I would benefit from that kind of technology, and so would my insurance policy. <laughs> well, on that note, guys. Perfect. Well, you, you've got we've got Volvo on the show, Jill. So you're halfway there. So don't I'm all for Volvo. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll Best safe car. We'll leave that in your hands. Yeah. Well, look, that's all for today, for today, guys. Danielle, thank you very much for you agreeing so much. to come and join us on the show. And um, thank you everyone else for tuning in for your questions. Um, as always, guys, you know, we're live every single week, same time, same place. If you're not already subscribed, make sure you do so. Hit the, uh, the bell icon below so you're notified when we go live. Um, apart from that, thank you again, Danielle. And I wish you all the best until we next speak. Thank you. Bye. Bye.